Little Falls is a small rural town in central Minnesota. 8,500 people. It's usually a trouble-free little town. Or at least it used to be. No, it's changed. And it would never be the same again once Byron Smith returned. Living like an old hermit in his house on Elm Street, which would become the scene of the kind of horror that movies are made of. And to many in town, old Byron was Freddy Krueger. But on the other hand, you had your people that felt Byron was a hero. Byron Smith had always been an enigma in Little Falls, where he was born and raised. He was widely respected as a man who'd spent his life serving his country, first in the Vietnam War, and then as a security expert for the State Department at U.S. embassies around the world. But there were also those who thought of the lifelong bachelor as a strange, mysterious recluse. He's kind of a loner. He was a very private person. He just wanted to mind his own business. He didn't really have very many friends. Largely because Byron had been living overseas. I'm sure he would have made many more friends than he had the opportunity to do. Kathy and John Lang, as well as other neighbors, say Byron would rarely venture far from his beautiful sprawling estate on the banks of the Mississippi River. He loved that, that house, he loved that land, and um, um, that was his pride and joy. When he retired from his job, he was gonna retire and move back home and live peacefully. Bill Anderson, who lives next door, says Byron had been living alone at the property for several years since retiring and inheriting it from his parents. But despite some perceptions to the contrary, Bill says Byron actually turned out to be very friendly and likable once he got to know him. Byron and I became real close friends, you know, we, um, we spent a lot of time together. The Langs say they also became good friends with Byron. He was a little shy, and then as you got to know him, we would invite him to go out to dinner with us every Friday night. He turned out to be a nice guy. I'd go down there two or three times a week and help him do stuff on the river, and we'd shoot guns and go fishing, and we'd go out to different events in town. But Little Falls had changed a lot since Byron had left town decades earlier. And he was said to be dismayed about the drug-related crime, including a recent wave of burglaries. And I can remember him saying a few times when all these things were going on, boy, when I traveled the country, I traveled the world, I never experienced stuff like this. Never experienced it till I retired and moved home. Bill says Byron's home had been burglarized several times, and although nothing of significant value was taken, the man was living in fear of someone possibly breaking in while he was there. And then as it went on, the break-ins kept on going. In fact, it, it got to a point when he told me one day, he says, Bill, when you come down to visit me, ring the doorbell, count to 10 and ring it again for I know it's you. Byron had never reported any of the robberies to police until finally he was robbed of thousands of dollars worth of possessions, including treasured keepsakes. And he said he had some old coins that were taken, and he also had a camera, and it sounded like he was very attached to this camera, and he said that he spent a lot of money on the camera. So he was pretty upset when he found out that his camera was taken. Deputy Sheriff Jamie Luberts, who'd gone to the house to investigate, says Byron also told him about the previous burglaries. How did the robberies personally impact Byron? I can tell that he was very upset about it. Deputy Luberts says Byron told him some firearms had been stolen in one of the earlier break-ins and that he was afraid the thieves might return armed with them. He did not have any type of surveillance at that time. And I suggested to him that he may be put up cameras. And Byron would concede he should have already done that. He was very proud of the fact that he worked for the State Department. He told me his job was doing a lot of audio recordings and setting up a lot of footage in that for the state. I said, so maybe it'll document these break-ins that are going on. Bill Anderson helped Byron install a state-of-the-art surveillance system. We put the cameras in. He put them in spots where they were sort of hidden. I think there was four or five cameras around, you know, around the house. And Byron would become even more reclusive, staying home, monitoring the security cameras on his computer. 
he didn't want to go anywhere because every time he left, he would be robbed. Kathy Lang says Byron wouldn't even join them for Thanksgiving dinner, as he'd done every year since he'd been back in Little Falls. He was afraid to leave his home even for Thanksgiving for fear that someone would break in? Correct. So he changed his whole lifestyle based on these break-ins? Of course. He was fearful. He didn't know who was doing this. Plus, they stole his guns. And eerily, it would be on that very same Thanksgiving day as Byron is home alone, guns at his side, monitoring his cameras, that alarm bells go off. It's the day after Thanksgiving in Little Falls, Minnesota. Black Friday. But this particular Black Friday will forever be known as the darkest day in the town's entire history. The horror of what has happened here begins to come to light on this Black Friday around noon when Bill Anderson gets a cryptic phone call from his Elm Street neighbor, Byron Smith. He says, could you find me a lawyer that I could talk to and send him down here? Bill assumes it's regarding the string of break-ins at Byron's house, then calls around for him. And had no luck at all. Because it's Black Friday. So I, um, I called Byron back. And he asked me to get in touch with this Deputy Luberts that was at his house and see if he would come out there. Deputy Jamie Luberts is the officer who is already investigating the burglaries. Did Byron tell you something significant had happened at his home? He actually told me I blew the top off the break-ins down here. Did you know what that meant? Nope. No idea whatsoever. But Bill calls the sheriff's office anyway, asking for Deputy Luberts. Is he there? No, he's not in today. Well, he's not in today. No. Um, Is there something I can help you with? Well, we got a serious problem out here in Riverwood area. Okay. What kind of problem are we talking? Well, we have a breaking situation we've been having on the home street. When Deputy Luberts can't be reached, his twin brother, Sergeant Jeremy Luberts, also with the Sheriff's Department, goes out to visit Byron. And Sergeant Luberts has a feeling something is amiss the moment he arrives at Byron's house. He had his hands raised above his head, like he was giving himself up for something. And that was just odd. You know, nobody usually does that. Even stranger, it doesn't initially appear to Sergeant Luberts that Byron has done anything wrong. He put his hands down and he invited us into his house and then started telling us what happened. Byron tells Sergeant Luberts and a patrol partner there has indeed been another break-in the day before on Thanksgiving afternoon. And he leads them down the hallway to his bedroom showing them a window that the intruders had smashed to gain entry to the house. I could tell by looking at the window, the glass was broken on the inside. So what it appeared that somebody was on the outside and broke into his house. So he then tells us he has something to show us downstairs. In the basement, which Byron has turned into an elderly gentleman's cave where he likes to sit and read. Surrounded in bookshelves. But Sergeant Luberts quickly becomes alarmed as he looks around the room. I can see on the floor, on the rug, right at the bottom of the stairs, what appears to be a blood spot. And then I can see what appeared to be a smear of blood on the wall. He also spots a pair of what are obviously kids' sneakers and really starts to get the creeps. It just seems odd, something's weird going on here. And it's about to go beyond weird to downright gruesome. There's a door closed. And he said the bodies are behind here. The bodies of two intruders, Byron admits he shot dead. When you open that door and you see those bodies laying there, what goes through your mind? At first, it was kind of shock. And tragically, the slain intruders would turn out to be a pair of unarmed local teenagers who were still in high school. 17-year-old Nicholas Brady and his 18-year-old cousin, Haley Kiefer. All of a sudden, we have two dead kids in a guy's house. I knew we had one mess of a case. 
Byron Smith is taken into custody on second degree murder charges and waves his Miranda rights to tell Sergeant Luberts his version of what happened that deadly Thanksgiving afternoon. I was in the basement in my favorite reading chair, reading a paperback, and I see a shadow go past the picture window. And then somebody's rattling the basement door trying to get in. But it also is locked and done all Byron says he watches the monitor of his new home surveillance system where cameras he just mounted outside show two intruders prowling around his house. And then the shadow leaves and I hear somebody walking across the deck. He watches as the intruders peer inside his windows. Like they're trying to see what they can see inside. They're also checking if any doors are unlocked. And I'm getting seriously stressed because somebody wants in and they're trying to sneak in, and it's happened before. Then Byron says something makes him panic. And I hear a glass window broken. So the old man says he grabs two of his guns, a mini-14 rifle and a 22 caliber pistol. In the past couple of weeks, I've gotten into the habit of carrying my guns with me inside my house, because I don't know who's going to break in when. And now he says he might have to use them. So I'm sitting there, and I hear the steps come down the hallway, turn around, and come down the stairs. Byron tells detectives he has a tough choice. And I decide that I've got a choice of either shooting or being shot. Suddenly, a dead Nicholas Brady is lying at the bottom of the stairway. After I shot him, I sat down in this chair, and, uh, just tingling adrenaline I hate adrenaline and my blood was pounding in my ears and I just uh, wanted to calm down more than anything else but the killing isn't over yet because Nick Brady's partner in crime is right behind him and I hear more footsteps coming down the hallway and somebody else starts down the stairs and Haley Kiefer is a dead girl walking I just couldn't think I didn't think, I wasn't thinking. I was just, they're ganging up on me. So I killed her too. Oh my God. Oh my God. But Sergeant Luberts can't understand why Byron would let the bodies of the two teenagers lie rotting in his home for a full day before calling police. I have to ask Byron, after the shooting and it's done, um, why didn't you call law enforcement to report what happened? I was pretty much afraid to do anything. An hour later, I had this screwball thought that seems sort of irrational now, but uh, just because my Thanksgiving screwed up, I don't need to screw up yours. Normally when I do something, I justify it. Normally when I do something, I know exactly why I'm doing it and what I expect. And even Sheriff Mikkel Wetzel, now retired, says Minnesota's so-called castle law permits residents to use deadly force if necessary to protect themselves and their property. Like Byron says he did when Nick Brady and his cousin Haley Kiefer broke into his Little Falls home on Thanksgiving Day. You were looking at the possibility that this was justifiable. Someone's breaking in his home, and he has the castle doctrine on his side. That is certainly one of the things we consider at the outset, and it's fair to say there's a bit of a presumption that he has a right to do what he did, at least at the outset. But Sheriff Wetzel and other investigators also have reason to believe Byron Smith may have crossed the line. And that's what was the difficult part here. He had the right to do some things, he did not have the right to do others. Like firing a total of nine bullets into the two unarmed teenagers in what appears to be a classic case of overkill. Why did you fire more shots than you needed to, do you figure? And I was very, very threatened, unhappy. And so angry about the string of burglaries at his home that investigators allege the 64-year-old retiree actually set a trap for the burglars, deliberately trying to lure them into his house. And they would base that claim largely on this surveillance video, captured on Byron's own home security system, showing him apparently hiding his truck on the morning of the killings to give the impression he wasn't home. 
Byron had moved his vehicle several blocks away, left it, and then walked back on a different route and went into the back of the house. Have you ever parked your vehicle over there before? No. No, you haven't. What made you want to park it over there? Out of sight. On Thanksgiving. Out of the way. Because I'm not leaving anything out where anybody can get to it. But wouldn't you be afraid somebody would come and break into it while it's parked along the road? They're not being raided over there. I'm being raided. Investigators allege he then lay in wait for the expected burglars in his old man cave in the basement, guns at the ready. He's got a full surveillance system around his house, cameras. He's watching the monitor while he's sitting in a chair waiting. I was monitoring two cameras on the basement door, one camera on the front living room door, and one camera looking at the approach to the main door from the driveway. Until, sure enough, Nick and Haley take the bait. Nick convinces himself nobody's home. And the horror of what happened after Nick and Haley break in is chronicled on this astounding audio tape found stashed on a bookshelf in Byron's basement. Listen as Byron sits alone, armed for battle, waiting for intruders to break in, planning their execution. Your left eye. He had been running an audio recorder that captured the actual break in, the shooting, and the aftermath of this entire incident. It's very chilling, very difficult uh, audio tape to listen to. A moment by moment, shot by shot soundtrack for what investigators claim is plainly cold blooded, premeditated murder. You don't ever hear a shooting going on unless you're directly involved in it. Then you do. But otherwise, you never hear such a thing. That's the sound of Nick Brady walking down the stairs to Byron's basement. And then I saw his feet, and then I saw his legs. Oh. Oh. And that's the sound of Byron shooting Nick in the chest with his Mini-14 rifle. So he tumbles down the stairs. While he's tumbling, Smith shoots him again, this time in the back. He's probably dead. He's certainly not moving. But Byron says otherwise. And he's looking face up at me. OK, then what? I shoot him in the face. Smith walks over, puts the rifle to his head, and blows his head off while he's saying, you're dead. You're dead. And Byron has a footnote about those sneakers investigators found in the house. One thing of importance. His shoes came off. Okay. His shoes, I kicked underneath the reading chair. They're still there. You can now hear the sound of Byron putting Nick's body on a tarp and hiding it in the adjoining room. So he dragged Nick's body out of the way. Covered the brain and blood matter all over the floor with a rug. Then he reloads his rifle and strikes again as Haley comes walking down those same basement stairs about 10 minutes later. He meant to hit her in the chest and kind of missed. Haley stumbles down the stairs, still alive, with just a bullet wound to the left arm. <laughs> then Byron's rifle jams. Oh, sorry about that. And then she laughed at me. I just pulled out the 22 and shot her. If you're trying to shoot somebody and they laugh at you, you go again. Investigators say a terrified and wounded Haley did not laugh. In fact, you can hear her pleading for her life. You're dying. But Byron shows no mercy. He just keeps shooting her. Fulfilling his promise from before. Your left eye. Byron shoots Haley in the left eye. Then finishing the teenager off with a final shot he claims was a mercy killing. As much as I hate someone, I don't believe they deserve pain. So I gave her a shot under the chin up into the cranium. But these inner thoughts he recorded after killing Haley say something else. Cute. I'm sure she thought she was a real pro. Sits down and talks to himself and tries to rationalize what he just did. 
Byron would wrap Haley in a tarp too, just as he had Nick and dump her body next to Nick's, apparently only sorry for the damage he'd done to his precious house. I felt like I was cleaning up a mess. Not like spilled food. Not like vomit. Not even like, not even like diarrhea. The worst mess possible. And I was stuck with Byron sounds both proud and bitter on his bizarre inner monologue audio recording. Because I try to be a decent person, they think I'm a patsy, I'm a sucker. They think I'm there for them to take advantage of. And he appears to be rehearsing his defense of the killings, blaming them on the string of burglaries at his house. I refuse to live with that level of fear in my life. With the bombshell evidence in hand, prosecutors upped the charges against Byron from second degree to first degree murder. He's bragging about what he did. Very proud of the fact that he killed these kids. The 12 men and women hearing this chilling audio recording of Byron fatally shooting teenagers Nicholas Brady and Haley Kiefer after they broke into his home in Little Falls, Minnesota. It's all fun, cool, exciting, highly profitable until somebody kills you. The prosecution then plays them that recording of Byron sharing his inner thoughts with himself in an eerie whisper as the kids' bullet-riddled bodies lie on his basement floor. I was doing my city duty, and I had to do it. He's trying to convince himself that he had a legal right to do it because, after all, they entered his dwelling. But defense attorney Steve Meshbesher insists to the jury that Byron did indeed have that right. He was scared. He was just scared. Prosecutor Pete Orpid argues that Byron had nothing to be scared of after already disabling the kids with his rifle. But then kept shooting anyway after allegedly luring them into his house to extract vengeance for previous burglaries at his home. Basically, he was almost lying in wait. That's how we viewed it. My argument to the jury was, this is, you know, because people in Minnesota are big deer hunters, and I said, isn't this just like deer hunting? And the prosecution portrays Nick, 17, and Haley, 18, as about as threatening as deer. Were Nick and Haley involved in previous burglaries? Did they have a record? I think they were on the radar a couple for some couple other minor um, possible break-ins and that, and just a little mischievous stuff but uh, nothing that was serious. Byron is said to have even known Nick, who'd done some summer work for him on his house. He had hired Nick and a couple of other Nick's friends to come over his house and rake his lawn, mow his grass, clean out his garage. But defense attorney Meshbesher claims Nick and his buddies had taken that opportunity to case the joint. Nick. Brady, unbeknownst to Byron, was sizing up his home. And he was checking it out for uh, a future burglary with a number of other friends of his, along with Miss um, Kiefer. But the prosecution says Byron should then have recognized Nick after he and Haley tried to break into his house. The defense argues there's no way Byron could have identified the intruders, known how old they were, or determined if they were unarmed. They came in with hoods covering their face, and you can't determine the age of a person when they have hoods on. You don't know if they're armed or not. When they have a coat on protecting them, they can have a firearm inside that coat and hidden from view. In fact, Byron's attorney claims Nick was actually suspected in some of the earlier break-ins. Mr. Uh, Byron did not go up the stairs looking for him. He hid in the basement to protect his own safety. He was frightened. He didn't know who it was. He couldn't see his face. And he shot the person who had broken into his home to protect himself and his home. The prosecution tells the jury the truth lies in the tape. 
claiming Byron had plenty of time to find out before unloading a total of nine rifle and pistol shots into Nick and Haley. And the jury didn't have a question because it was all recorded. They knew what happened. They, they could hear him like when he's shooting Haley. You're dying. And he's saying that while he's shooting her. I mean, it's, it's hard to hear. But defense attorney Meshbesher says Byron continued to shoot after already stopping Nick and Haley in their tracks because of a phenomenon known as the fog of battle. Did he have to unload on those teenagers without a doubt, without a chance of them surviving? I have represented police officers in the past. And a lot of times when they're in a stressful situation, they cannot tell how many times they shoot. They pull the trigger out of fear, and it's instinctive in all human beings. They shoot and pull the trigger several times, and they can't remember the number of times they pulled the trigger. Meshbesher says the fog of battle phenomenon also explains why Byron didn't dial 911 the moment he spotted the teens at his house on his surveillance monitors, or even right after he'd killed them. Why did Byron decide to wait 24 hours until the next day to call police? Very simple. He was scared that there were other people involved. He was scared that they'd be coming in from the outside. He was afraid that if he went outside and immediately called the police, he'd be shot, maybe even with his own guns that had been stolen by a third or fourth party. But the jury doesn't buy it, taking just several hours to find Byron Smith guilty of the first and second degree murder of Nick Brady and Haley Kiefer. The judge sentencing him to life without parole. I think jurors had the idea that this little old man is getting rung up by the big state government. But within a day or two of hearing the evidence, I think that changed their minds. These kids didn't have to die. I believe they did not. I think it was an execution of two kids that did not pose a threat to him at any time. Heartbroken and angry family members of Nick and Haley couldn't agree more. Played judge, jury, prosecutor, executioner, um, and took their lives. And he did it on purpose, and he planned it. And Nick's mother is disgusted that Byron Smith continued to feel justified in killing the teens. I don't believe he felt remorse. Um, that alone would have been something, but I don't believe he felt that. But there are those in Little Falls, Minnesota, who still believe Byron Smith did nothing wrong, including his next door neighbor, Bill Anderson. You're saying that he had the right to do what he did. Yes. And you're saying you would have done the same thing? I would have done the same thing. Still, others who initially stood up for Byron Smith, including longtime friend John Lang, now concede the old man went too far. Byron Smith made some of the mistakes. There's no doubt about it. He should have called the cops right away, and he obviously snapped. And Byron's biggest mistake, apart from heartlessly taking two young lives? You're dying recording what he did and trying to explain it to himself. How did this recording hurt Byron? Well, what it did was it, it brought the jury right there. You know, usually you're asking a jury, what was his state of mind? I'll tell you what his state of mind is. Listen to it. I don't give a damn who she is. It's all fun, cool, exciting, highly profitable until somebody kills you.